hallelujah. And we glorify you, God. And we give you, ha, we give you, hallelujah, all the praise, hallelujah, and all the glory, hallelujah, for all the things, God. We pray for your people everywhere, hallelujah. You said one day you coming back for a church without a spot or wrinkle, oh God. Help us, oh God. Oh God, oh God, to be ready, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Help us, oh God, to just get closer to you, God. Help us, oh God, to stay in your word. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God, we thank you. Hallelujah. We thank you for your faithfulness, God. We thank you for your faithfulness, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we look around, God, we see oh God, how bad, oh God, we need you. Help us to hold on, hallelujah. We believe, God, but help our unbelief, oh God, hallelujah, hallelujah. Increase, oh God, increase our faith, oh God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, oh God, oh God, help us, oh God, tonight. Thank you, God, for everyone, oh God, for every family, hallelujah, represented here tonight, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, 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 thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, God, we love you, God, we honor you, Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for caring enough, oh God, about us, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God, to stretch out your hands, oh God, hallelujah, hallelujah, all the way to the cross, oh God, we thank you, Jesus, ah, hallelujah, hallelujah, thank you, God, hallelujah, God, we praise you, Lord, and we honor honor you and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, God, for your goodness, God, and your mercy. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, because you said, oh, God, no weapon, hallelujah, formed against us, oh, God. God, shall prosper, hallelujah, you didn't say they wouldn't be formed, God, but you did say they wouldn't prosper, help us, oh God, to have on the whole armor, hallelujah, of God, so that we may be able to stand the wiles, oh God, those dirty tricks, oh God, those schemes, oh God, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, of the enemy, me, oh God, strengthen us, oh God, as we continue, hallelujah, on this journey, hallelujah, oh God, strengthen us, hallelujah, 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 let our minds be on you, oh God, from the time we wake up in the morning, oh God, till we close our eyes at night, oh God, we thank you, hallelujah, we plead the blood, hallelujah, over the enemy, hallelujah, they cannot and will not, hallelujah, have our children, oh God, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, we place them before you tonight, oh God, that you will cover their mind, oh God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, God, hallelujah, God, we thank you. You, hallelujah. We love you tonight, oh God. We love you tonight, oh God. Fix it, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Fix it, oh God. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God, we give you the praise. 
and we give you the glory and we give you the honor in Jesus name hallelujah did anybody come on late that might have a praise report or a prayer request hallelujah hallelujah thank you Jesus hallelujah hallelujah did I mention um yesterday that Liz's um, aunt passed away from COVID. No, but we pray right now, God, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Cover that family, oh God, right now in the name of Jesus. Cover Liz and her family, God, in the loss of her aunt. Give them comfort, oh God, only like you can, God. Hold them up, oh God, for this time, God, and forevermore, God, as they belong to you, oh God, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Give them peace, oh God, in the name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Thank God. Hallelujah. And amen. Elder Blue. Amen. Elder amen. Blue. Yes. Um, this is Elder Renee. Um, I have a praise report. One of my sisters had his eye surgery this morning. It was very successful. We praise Yay. God for that. And she's doing well. And um, my, my ankle is coming along nicely. And I'm just looking for a positive report in the next few days when I go see the doctor. Yeah, man. Thank you. Amen. Thank God. We praise God for that praise report. He just keeps on doing good things for us. And we thank God for that. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you. We're going to go ahead and um, go into our, <clears throat> our lesson for tonight. And um, so good evening, and we thank God for you for joining us tonight for prayer and for Bible study, and we welcome all of you on Zoom and you who have joined us on Facebook as we continue our study in Ephesians using the book, The Believer's Position and a Disciple's Practice, a Bible study of the book of Ephesians. Last week, we concluded with conduct in the conflict and Minister Shaw expounded on the whole armor of God and the necessity to have on the whole armor and how we just need to take a stand, take a stand today so that we don't fall for anything. So today I will conclude with the whole matter followed by a summary um, next week. So we are now on my 13, which is the conclusion out of Ephesians 6, 19 to 24. Um, and I put this scripture down. I'm just going to go ahead because I'm going to see if uh, people remember that. Okay. As we go on. All right. <clears throat> what are you living for? What are you living for? What drives your existence? What are you about? Every last one of us have one grand passion. The question is, is it worth it? Thank you. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Does it have value beyond the life? Is it meaningful in light of eternity? So when you think about it, think about what is your one grand passion? I, I'm going to share a brief story with you about a man. One young man scored tickets to the Super Bowl one year, though seated in the very last row. And as the game got going, he noticed an empty seat beside an elderly gentleman, like 10 rows up on the 50 yard line. Taking a chance, he made his way down and he asked if the seat was taken. 
And the man replied, no, you can have it. I used to bring my wife to every Super Bowl game, but since she passed away, I've gone alone. The young man asked, well, why didn't you invite your friends? And the old man replied, I can't because they're all at the funeral. See, he had passion, but it was sad, wasn't it? It was a sad kind of passion. I prefer the passion that drove Paul, one that I hope will set our hearts on fire. In the last verses of this great letter, he bears his heart. It's not purposeful. He's just signing off. But he gives us an unguarded glimpse of his grand passion. So let's look at his concerns for himself. Let's look at his concerns for himself and for others as an example to follow. He was concerned first that he would be faithful. Think about that. It, 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 with his passion, he thought most and foremost, I just want to be faithful. I just want to be faithful. And in verses 19 and 20, listen to what Paul says. He says, and pray for me that words may be given to me when I open my mouth to proclaim boldly the mystery of the good news of salvation for which I am an ambassador in chains and pray that in proclaiming it, I speak boldly and courageously as I should. Now this is Paul's fifth year of imprisonment, chained and shackled to a guard for 24 seven. My question to you is this, if you were imprisoned and you were chained to a guard for 24 seven, 24 hours every day of the week, what would you ask for if they allowed you to ask for anything? What would you ask for? Get me out of here. Get me out of here. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Some alone time. Some alone time. Okay. Yes. 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 Some alone time. I, I, I know for me, I would ask prayer for my physical well-being. And I'm thinking about getting relief from the pain that the shackles have created on my flesh. Uh, I would ask for relief for my scar written back. I would ask for prayer to release me so that I continue my travels and my missionary activities. But um, you all probably know about Paul. Paul didn't ask for that though. He didn't ask for any of that. Being shackled all that time, he didn't ask for any of that. His request was that he be faithful. That is his passion, that he not mess up, that he represent the king correctly, despite the circumstances and all his physical impairment and dreams for future ministry were subordinate to the passion of his heart, that he be fruitful. What, what, what is your passion? What is your one passion that drives you? Paul refused to let circumstances dictate his emotions or dash his hopes. And I thought about that. And I've been thinking about this for a while. And I thought about, listen, how easily 
it is to allow circumstances to override the moment. Sometimes if you're not thinking, if you're not careful, if you're not whatever, you know, I had a situation today uh, and soon as I was confronted with the situation, I let the circumstances overwhelm me. And I begin to text somebody and I was like, okay, this is bothering me. Okay, I, I got this going on. And then I had to stop and say, okay, Lord, okay, what, what, Lord, what do you want me to do in this situation? My emotions were running away and getting the best of me. But see, Paul said he rather have faithfulness over his circumstances, all right? He would have none of it. He is the ultimate example of what I just said, faithfulness over circumstances faithfulness over circumstances and listen he said i am an ambassador in change now here's another question for you when you think of an ambassador what do you think of somebody that represents me mm -hmm. yes someone with influence Yes, yes, yes. They have a political clout, right? When we think of ambassadors, that's what we think about. We think about the political clout that they may have. And when you deal with an ambassador, you deal with the power of those that sent them. And there are buildings in DC that reek of this power. Ambassadors are VIPs and they have diplomatic immunity. Yet, let's look at Paul. Here is Paul, the greatest ambassador in history, residing in the grandest political center in the world at the time, or at any time, if you think about it, representing, are you ready for this? The king of king in change. Still representing the king of kings bound but representing the king of kings in chain. How do we represent God when we're in chains? What is that look like? Just something to ask yourself. What does that look like? Because remember, at all times, we are representing the king of kings. An ambassador in change, y'all said it was a paradox. In chains, dreams crush, body torn, yet he was still an ambassador. And his prayer, that he be faithful, a good ambassador. He was about to appear before Caesar Nero to plead his case, but he is not a helpless prisoner dependent on the court's mercy. No way, no way, no way. That's how the world sees him. And he rejects that view. He sees himself for what he really is as heaven sees him as an ambassador for Christ in chains. Yes, but no less an ambassador. And his only concern is to represent the master well. Wow. As Paul encouraged the Ephesians, if you're going to represent Christ, represent him well. There's no half step in here. Can't be one foot in the door and the other foot on a banana peel. Can't be that. But Paul knew what life was all about. He understood that. Do we know what life is all about? Because Paul got it. He understood it. He knew that his life was wrapped up and entangled in Christ. And I just believe that everything he did, he breathed Christ. He slept Christ. He woke Christ. 
everything about him was what could he do for Christ. He knew what life was about. He had some concerns for himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now, how, how, how could Paul do all of this? And so I'm kind of going back to Ephesians 3 and 1, where it says, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, he, he knew who he was. And he accepted the fact that I'd rather be a prisoner of Jesus Christ, because even though I'm in prison, it has no effect on me being still a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'm still I'm still a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'm still speaking and living of uh, Jesus Christ. And I, and I said, come on, Paul, you in shackles? <laughs> really, Paul? A prisoner of Jesus Christ? You in shackles to Caesar? In prison on trumped up charges? Just made up stuff? You are a prisoner of the state? Really? See, it's about perspective. Where is your perspective when it concerns your life with Christ? Not from Paul's perspective though. That's the world's view. That was the world's view. Paul saw beyond the shadows. Paul saw reality. Ephesians 2 and 6 says, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He was serving a glorious lifetime sentence to Christ. Caesar was like a momentarily inconvenience. What about the momentarily inconveniences we find that happened to us in our lives. Here he is sitting in the jail in Rome. <laughs> no, 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 that's not what Paul says. Paul says that God raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Imagine serving a life sentence and being able to sit there in that jail and still realize, you know what? This is only a momentarily inconvenience till I could get to where I need to go for Christ. Yes, momentarily inconvenience. So like I said, Paul saw beyond it. Can we see beyond our circumstances to what God is really trying to do in this move of the spirit right now. Can you see it in the spirit? Because you cannot see it in your flesh. You've got to see it through the spirit's eye. The move of God and where God is not only moving us individually and collectively, but also as a church. And I mean the church, not the building, but God, what are you doing and how are you moving in this time? So though he was physically in jail in Rome, in reality, Paul was seated in heavenly places with Christ. He was a prisoner of Christ. He resided in Christ and was the ambassador for Christ. And he longed to be faithful. He had something worth living and dying for. So what passion drives us? Is it something that will be over when this life is over? Or is it tied to eternity? And if it is something 
that is only at this moment, then we're going to be in trouble. Mm. Paul got it. He realized Philippians 3 and 20, for our conversation or our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus. He got it. He understood that. And that's why he could be shackled literally 24 7 and still represent the king of kings. Still, no matter where he went in that prison, which was probably not much movement, but he did what he could. Do you know that he did everything he could to represent Christ in the small place that he was in? How are we representing Christ with the ability to not be imprisoned in any jail? And, and God forbid if we are imprisoned in our own mind, because if we are imprisoned in our own mind, God said, I came to set you free because I want you to be free. So he want to break that. So if you are shackled today in your mind, in any kind of way, God said, I am here to deliver you and set you free. All believers are ambassadors for Christ. Do you know that it's just not Paul? who was an ambassador for Christ. Second Corinthians 5 and 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new is come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's heaven's perspective on our reason for living, right? That is, and God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, who has the message of reconciliation? We do. We do, we all do, not just the ministers, the elders, the everybody, we all do that are in Christ. We have that message of reconciliation, right? So, you know, we as believers need to understand what our authority is in Christ and the authority that God has given us in him to be reconcilers, to reconcile others. And I keep saying relationships are so important. We need to make sure that we are doing all we can to reconcile, to bring back together that wholeness of relationships. People are broken. People are hurting and people are waiting for a word from God. They need to know that God is there. And yes, he has a voice that can help them to get comforted, to know that they can make it with God. So we are all ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made us to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
We are citizens of heaven from which we serve as ambassadors. Listen, if our ultimate passions, and I said this earlier, if our ultimate passions are here, they are misplaced. They are misplaced. If our ultimate passions are of this world, it is very possible that we are Christians in name only. So again, for you, what is your passion? How we serve our ambassadorship will matter. We want to be faithful. Circumstances, even prison, are merely the opportunity that God gives us to be faithful. It can listen to that. So whatever we are going through, whatever circumstances are in our way or we find ourselves in right now, it is just God's opportunity of giving us a chance to be faithful. And we have to say, are we faithful? Yes, go ahead, um, Elder Matt, Dr. Matt. What I was thinking about was um, Paul either got on that that guard's nerves or caused him to convert. Yeah. If not both, yes. If, not, if he was being, if he wanted to be faithful, then that means that he was definitely prophesying and and, and speaking of God's and Christ's goodness the whole time. And I can imagine he was worrying that God something if he stuck to him twenty four seven. Just you know, that's what just came to me. So he was an ambassador and probably caused the guards to convert. And yes, he did. And, and you know, and as I go further on, I even have that in there, that imagine, <laughs> imagine being shackled to him, hearing about Christ 24 seven. Where are you going? You can't run from that. And yes, he did cause them. But what Paul realized, he realized that too, uh, Dr. Matt, and he also realized he didn't save a one of them, but because of the Christ in him, wow, God gave him that opportunity and said, let me see how faithful you're going to be. Even when I put you in this situation, are you still going to be faithful? Are you still going to share the word? Yeah, I know that that situation isn't going right and, and this happened and, and that is happening now and things seem to be out of control. But God said, no, I'm asking you, are you going to be faithful? Are you going to show up and do what God has asked you to do in spite of the circumstance? Yes. Move this back over. Okay. So he had concerns for himself. Words worthy for a king. All right, I don't know. He wanted to be fitting. He wanted to be faithful, but also fitting. He wanted his words to resonate. Wow. You know, he wanted his words to be there. <laughs> he, when he was in prison, he was with them. But for those who were not shackled to him, he wanted them to hear those words over and over and over and over again. It's like a, a, a song in your head that you can't get out. And, and, and I bet that's how it was for them that her Paul, they just couldn't get it out of their head. He wanted those words to be compelling. I love Paul's heart. I love his heart because like I said, not only did he want to be faithful, but he also wanted to be fitting. I love his heart. Ephesians 6 and 19 says, and pray for me that words may be given to me when I open my mouth. Listen, he said, pray for him. So when he opened up his mouth, anything won't come out. 
the flesh won't come out, but only what God has given, mm, only what God has given him to say, to proclaim boldly the mystery of the good news of salvation. That was his concern. He said, listen, I'm going to ask you to pray. He was a praying man and he did not mind asking for prayer. He said, because I want to make sure that everything I say aligns up with God. And everything I say aligns up with what he is telling me to say. He didn't ask for prayer, for pain, or prayer to release him, or for his physical comfort, or for a miraculous intervention. Look at what he said. He said, and pray for me that my words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly, boldly. How bold are we in Christ? How bold are we? Can the enemy come along and get you not to say what you need to say? Maybe it's a stranger. Maybe it's somebody in the family. I don't know. Maybe it's something, but, the, but God is saying, say this. You need to say this. You need to say this. Do you back down? He said boldly, but pray for me. And we have to ask others to pray for us. To pray for us. Yes. So that... What you know, and I thought about this. I said, wait a minute, Paul was asking for people to pray for him. So the words that came out of his mouth, I was thinking, Paul, what do you mean? You you have words, you wrote Ephesians and all of these other things. And I said, Lord, why words? Why his words? Because Paul longed to present the gospel graciously and persuasively, and that's that's a double whammy, graciously, but yet persuasively. He showed the mystery of the gospel that is universally inclusive. It's not just for Israel, it's for everyone. It's just not for Israel, as I said, it's for everyone. Paul knew he needed wisdom to show the death and the resurrection of Christ is for everyone. And his audience is diverse. Well, right now it's mainly the guards. Uh, and I do have here what you said, Dr. Matt, think of that being chained to Paul for eight hours a day. Uh, they didn't have a chance, did they? Um, not at all, but it's for everyone. But not because it was Paul, but because Paul would not keep quiet about his faith. Paul would not keep quiet. And you know, you don't have to preach the word to everybody you see, but listen, I do believe that people still ought to see and notice a difference in how we just carry ourselves and how we speak and how we enter, what we entertain and how we entertain. If we begin to look so much like the world, the world is going to always be confused. If the church looks like the world, doing more and more to do what they feel they need to do, no, no. I believe whoever spoke um, last week, someone said something about holiness is still right. Holiness is still right. Paul never saved anyone, but Paul used his faithfulness just like we can to change the hearts of people. Our faithfulness, our, whatever we're doing, we're going to do it onto God, onto God's glory. Whatever job I got, I'm going to do it on the God's glory so that he will get the glory. Philippians 1, 12 and 14 says, 
I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me really served to advance the gospel. Really? Really, Paul? I, I, I want to be able to, to say that. But Paul went through a lot. And so, you know, Paul went through a lot to be able to say that really what he did helped him to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole empirical guard. And those were the guys that were chained to Paul both night and day. And to all that rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers haven't become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment. There you go. They became converted, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. God, help us. Help us, Lord. Help us to speak the word without fear. Help us, oh God, to do that in our daily lives, to speak the word through kindness, through the fruit of the spirit, through our gifts in the ministry. Paul need words for his audience of guards. Paul was also about to have an audience with Caesar. That's a whole different level. And Paul wanted to have fitting words there too. So his burden was to show Christ in all his glory, in all his glory. Paul longed for the message to be fitting, clear, and compelling. He wanted words like Jesus, dripping with grace and truth. And he wanted to be fearless. Ephesians 6 and 20 says, for which I am an ambassador in change and pray that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly and courageously as I can. Paul's final concern for himself was astounding. Look at verse 20 there, that I might declare it. The gospel boldly as I ought to speak, that I might declare the gospel, he said, boldly. Are you kidding me? Paul is asking for prayer. Are you kidding me? Yes. Paul is asking for prayer for boldness. Yes, pray for me to be bold, he said. That is amazing. And you know why Paul was so bold? Because he prayed for it. And he was not ashamed to ask others to pray for the boldness for him. For Paul, specific prayer and effective witnessing went hand in hand. That's what he felt went hand in hand. Do we want to be bold? Do we even want to share Christ at all? When was the last time we asked God for boldness for ourselves or for someone else? Even for ourselves or for someone else? Matthew 10, 32 to 33 says, do we implicitly deny him by our silence? <clears throat> Well, I'm just not going to say anything. Well, okay, they'll figure it out sooner or later. And compromise? Well, you know, I just, I, I, I want to be able to be with, you know, this person or that, or I want to be able to do this. I'm just going to compromise just a little bit, just a little, no, no compromise. That's what the world sees. We don't need to compromise Christ. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my father, which is in heaven. But whosoever should deny me from men, him will I also deny before my father, which is in heaven. And if Jesus denies you before the father, that's it. That's it. No hope. 
We are on holy and serious and challenging ground here. Do we name the name of Christ or do we implicitly deny him by our silence and compromise? We need to pray for boldness. And I'm reminded in Acts 4 with Peter and John, how they healed the man at the temple and were arrested and boldly proclaimed that they did it in the name of Jesus because there is no other name among heaven which by must they um, must be saved. And then as we move on to Acts 4 and 31, it says here, and when they had prayed, they didn't stop. The place where they were meeting together was shaken. They didn't stop. They just eventually, I mean, the rulers did what they did. They warned Je Peter and John and told them, look, you guys can't do this um, or whatever. Peter and John just went back to other believers and prayed for what again? Boldness, right? So that they can have the result that they had in this first 4 and 31 a sign of God's presence. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and begin to speak the word of God with boldness and courage. And then we have Titius, who is, was Paul's transporter, the dear brother who was so faithful. Who, who is, are you helping to carry that word to? Who are you helping? Who are we representing? We know who we represent down here too, but we are representing Christ. And, and this is how he was. He was such a dear and faithful servant in the Lord that he was able to go and carry this word. And uh, in the book, it said, prayer warriors need to be informed of what they are praying for. And I put whenever possible, whenever possible. Yeah, if we can be specific, do it. We don't need to know all, all the time. It's not, you know, good for us to know. Sometimes you just tell somebody, pray, just pray. I just need prayer. And, and we let the Holy Ghost do that. We let the Holy Ghost um, do that. But he was called a dear brother of Paul and a faithful servant of the Lord in Colossians 4, 7, and 8. He was a faithful minister and fellow servant who was with Paul during his first Roman imprisonment. He was entrusted to deliver Paul epistles. Paul needed someone to work for him. And he asked him to help him to get this word where it needed to be. And moving on, getting to the end, the benediction um, at the end in that um, sixth chapter, the 23rd and the 24th verse, we have the benediction, which is a short, concise statement given in the Bible in the form of a petition, an assurance, a promise, or an affirming word. Often it pronounces a divine blessing upon the recipient. The word benediction means to say something good, to voice good thoughts, or to pronounce a declaration. And in Ephesians 6, 23 and 24, there were four words that stood out in this scripture. Peace be to the brothers and sisters and love. Look how he's ending this letter. Joined with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be with all of you and love all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with undying and incorruptible love. And there are four great words in the gospel. He started with grace. He ended with grace, but peace, love, faith, and grace. Paul ends the letter the way he starts it with reference to grace and peace, which are the two cornerstones for the Christian life. Our love for God, for the Lord should be undying. Paul ended by pronouncing a blessing, which was his way of helping the Ephesians to walk in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places of Christ. And now the conclusion. Every day we must make the decision how we will fight the spiritual warfare that we are in. We have to make a conscious decision. In Philippians 4 and 6, it says, do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything, every circumstance or situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific request known to God. 
And the petition, just as it is in the political arena, is a request to a sovereign to take some action. Any request made by God of God is thus a petition. Prayer, on the other hand, is any communication with God. All such petitions presented to God are delivered as prayer, but there are forms of prayer like glorification and confession and thanksgiving. These are not petitions. And there's a Puritan adage that said, pray until you pray. Pray, pray until you pray. Just pray. Don't be afraid. Just pray. You pray until you pray. And I'm going to close with this question. What does it mean to pray in the spirit? We hear that all the time. What does it mean to pray in the spirit? Ephesians 6 and 18 says, praying in all ways with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching there too with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. What does it mean to pray in the spirit? When you're, when you're saying what God says and when you're not looking at the natural things, you're not praying flesh things. Mm -hmm. or um, things of comfort, but you're speaking what you get from the spirit. Mm -hmm. And even though we know the word even say that there are times when um, we, for we don't even know what we ought to pray for. And the spirit itself make an intercession for us through groanings, which not can be uttered. So, you know, it's not in the abundance of words or anything like that, but it's just a humble heart turned towards God and really seeking God for the things of God that he will have us to, um, to seek him for. And um, we thank you for joining us tonight for uh, prayer and Bible study. And um, we look forward to you joining us next week as we finish this um, book on Ephesians. Elder Bull. Yes. I have a question. Uh, you were saying about praying in the spirit. Mm hmm Was the question. Uh, would speaking in tongues fall into that category? You know, I, I, it's, it, I, it's, when you thought, when you spoke that question, I thought, well, what about people who don't? What about people who don't speak in tongues? You well, know, everybody doesn't speak in tongues, but everybody has their own way of communicating right. with God in the spirit. And I was just thinking some people do, you know, praying in the spirit to me would look like or seem like people that uh, speak in tongues, the, the, the ones that do. But the other ones that don't doesn't mean that they don't, they're not praying in the spirit. It's right. just, we all have our different uh, dialogue or conversation uh, with the Lord. Yes, yes. I think it's an humbleness of our heart towards God, exactly. turn towards God, you know, not so much, you know, are you speaking in tongues or are you doing this? I think it's the humbleness of our heart and where our heart is turned towards God as we communicate and as we listen to hear God's voice. And I am done for tonight. Amen. Wonderful lesson. Good night, everyone. Wonderful lesson. I'll be Thank you.